The word of God is alive and powerful, sharpening a two-edged sword, piercing him to the dividing the center, the soul, and the spirit, the joints, and the marrow. It's a critic of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished into all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. We continue our studies this evening in the doctrine of resurrection. We'll pick up Roman numeral 5, page 4 of our notes. All right, before we begin the study, we'll make sure that we are prepared spiritually. Uh, that demands that we check our STA at the door, so to speak. That is, any personal sin in life. We've applied 1 John 1, 9 towards that sin or sins. In our prayer of confession, God forgives us of our sins. He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Uh, 1 John 1, 9, written to believers, for believers, recognizing that we continue to engage in personal sin in life, and it also provides for us the mechanics to be filled with God the Holy Spirit. It is under his filling role uh, that we are guided and directed and led into the truth of Bible doctrine. The uh, Bible is not meant to be understood through simply academic process of the brain-computer demands a spiritual apparatus for perception, that is, God the Holy Spirit, which in union, compatibility with our human spirit, enlightens us in such a way. So with that in mind, we'll give you an opportunity to rebound if necessary as we start with a normal word of prayer. <clears throat> Father, again, thank you for your many grace and mercies. Thank you for the fellowship this evening with one another, with like-minded believers. We ask you to continue to enlighten us regards to the theology at hand so that we can have a better frame of reference and grasp regards to doctrine in and of itself. All this via God the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Moving on here in the doctrine of resurrection, which we are dealing with the resurrection of Jesus Christ in Roman numeral five, which that very principle is central uh, to the gospel message. Uh, more importantly, in regards to positional truth, that is salvation phase one in our new union in the person of Jesus Christ when we believe in his person as the object of our faith, that we are placed in the union, as we saw throughout the Gospel of John. John continually used the Greek preposition eis with respect to faith or belief, denoting that we believe literally into him. And in this capacity, uh, resurrection is central in regards to Christ in his name and reputation of who he claimed he was Obviously, he is not in front of us. We are not in the position dispensationally as simply having to identify his person in time uh, for faith to be exercised and uh, culminated in regards to saving grace. Uh, we must believe in regards to his name, and his name is his reputation, and his reputation is that he proclaimed to be God in the flesh. Uh, he went to the cross and died for our sins, and three days later was resurrected as validation of his success and victory on the cross. And by believing in this, uh, positionally then, uh, we are in line uh, to receive a resurrection body as his. It obviously has also experiential ramifications, which we'll deal with to a certain degree in regards to the doctrine, in that the resurrection body, the new one that we receive in this respect, uh, will parallel uh, what we did with doctrine and time versus the lack of application in that regards. So the resurrection of Christ uh, is documented clearly for us in Scripture. Uh, it's, as we saw, uh, the subject of Old Testament prophecy at point A there is literal, physical, bodily resurrection uh, through explicit prophecy, as we saw in Psalm 1610 that is quoted by Peter in Acts 2, and then also Psalm 2-7, quoted by Paul in Acts 13, and we compare to Hebrews 1.5 in that respect. And while there is no particular terminology in the Old Testament, 
uh, to point to resurrection, if you will, in a definitive way, uh, it is otherwise exampled uh, by typology, if you will, in regards to reality of resurrection. And hence, uh, it is implicit prophecy, as we saw through the sacrifice of Isaac by Abraham, as God commanded him. And uh, we are told that Abraham uh, and Isaac are a type of God the Father and the type of Christ uh, in this respect. And that Abraham uh, looked at the promise of resurrection to uh, sustain him and maintain focus to uh, be willing to engage in the act of killing his promised son, Isaac, otherwise. So uh, through typology there, uh, we see that representing the resurrection of uh, the Son of God uh, by the Father and his involvement in that regards uh, be the ascensions of Enoch and Elijah, where simply God uh, removed him from the planet physically. Uh, that pictured resurrection, a uh, future resurrection, pointing to Jesus Christ as the first uh, of resurrection, and then believers that would follow, obviously, in that regards. And then see uh, the miracle of the tomb of Elisha, uh, where the person fell into the graves and actually touched his bones. Uh, obviously, he had decayed, and uh, the skeletal structure was what was left, and the person was dead that fell into the grave, and he was revived. Uh, that also uh, implies prophetically of a type of resurrection uh, as uh, it is associated uh, with death and a rebirth uh, physically and literally in that regards. Then 3, 8.3, uh, Jesus Christ himself referenced the miracle of Jonah and the well to picture his death, resurrection, and ascension as a conclusive sign to Israel of his claim as Messiah. Uh, in spite of all the signs, if you want to uh, define them as such, and legitimately so, of all his miracles, of healing the sick, of raising the dead, etc., etc. The arrogance of religiosity, the arrogance of religious types is to uh, demand and expect uh, some type of sign that fits within uh, their mode of distorted view in regards to uh, the principle and doctrine at hand here as it reflects upon identifying Jesus Christ as the Messiah of Israel. And uh, Jesus refused to cater. You don't have to cater to these religious types out there. Uh, you're not obligated to. Uh, they want to uh, throw stuff at you, let them throw it. Uh, it's not going to uh, mean a hoot in regards to anything in regards to your life other than just staying in fellowship, uh, feeling it as such. Uh, obviously, uh, there is a place and time uh, for apologetics or defense of the faith as it may come upon us. Uh, but often, uh, you just have uh, people that uh, are not really serious about the truth. Uh, they are wrapped up in their own religiosity, and all they want to do uh, is express themselves as such uh, to uh, look smarter or uh, to take issue in regards to you and your stand for the truth, uh, the kind of church you go to, and all these other things that may be wrapped up in their uh, little SCA minds uh, that seek to uh, uh, bring about these types of approaches to people. So. Uh, Jesus did not cater to these types. Uh, he simply gave them the doctrine uh, as it was. And uh, if you can't figure out the doctrine uh, in the interpretation of it on your own, uh, then you'll remain to be lost, basically. And uh, he calls these types of people evil. Uh, again, uh, it tends to be uh, sometimes uh, an emotional aspect of response from uh, believers uh, with respect to people uh, that may approach them along these types of lines uh, to somehow spoon feed them uh, things of this nature. You need to recognize what they are before God. A man can have their own ideas, their own perceptions, their own uh, definitions of what they think others are. But it's our role, it's our uh, purpose, it's, it's our witness uh, to represent all these things according to doctrine. And therefore, you've got to lay aside your emotions. And uh, you've got to put aside any familiarity otherwise that may be involved in regards to these things. And recognize this Bible doctrine uh, that is all important. And uh, it reflects upon uh, the very uh, issue in regards to volition of people. Uh, that the truth truly is the net uh, to be a fisher of men. 
and it doesn't, uh, you don't have to uh, go out, you don't have to buy a special lure, you don't have to troll, uh, you simply are in the world, you throw out the net, the net of truth, and uh, the fish that are ready to be uh, wrapped up in regards to the net uh, and captured by the plan of God in that regards are those who are positive to the gospel message uh, that uh, when opportunity is otherwise provided to them. And you can apply that both on phase one and phase two levels. Uh, so often uh, because of the denominationalism and because of their pigeonholing, uh, the only real doctrine that they want to promote in regards to their life, and that's getting to heaven and escaping hell, uh, they completely uh, are uh, completely defunct uh, in regards to uh, the phase two gospel. You're hard pressed to go anywhere apart from where a verse by verse teaching is being presented uh, and sound teaching in that regards to uh, truly hear uh, the phase two issues in regards to the Christian life. Go down the street, uh, you have their big marquees out there, uh, worship service Sunday, uh, choir second session, you know, and uh, 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 parents night without kids on uh, Thursday night, and a Bible study uh, half an hour on Wednesday. And you'd be hard pressed if it's a pastor that's conducting it. Uh, these are people that are completely blind in regards to the spiritual gifts and uh, what those gifts are designed uh, uh, to uh, bring about uh, on behalf of positive volition in regards to this world. I'm a pastor teacher uh, because my primary gift of teaching is designed to function in a pastoral role that explains the gift. There are other, others have the gift of teaching simply. Uh, females can have that gift, uh, but it's designed to teach Bible doctrine. And it's pastor's primary role uh, to teach that doctrine uh, first and foremost from the pulpit, of which the teachers uh, then that might be subordinate to that uh, follows along the same lines of that doctrine to teach to others such as children in that regards. And don't get me going about women pastors. I guess their excuse when they get before Christ was, well, I was identifying as a male. <laughs> But anyway, <laughs> we'll get around that doctrine, won't we? <clears throat> All right, B, Christ taught that he would not be conquered by the power of death. Uh, by all appearances, as it may uh, look to others around him, uh, look like death got him just like it did everybody else in this world. Uh, it looked like the religious leaders uh, had their day. Uh, we killed him. Yeah, well, not for long. And he truly uh, is the remedy. Uh, obviously, uh, it's a big fantasy and drive uh, the human race to uh, find the secret to eternal life to the secret to perpetual good health. Uh, our society thinks you can find it through the pharmaceutical world somehow. Uh, the mystic types are more or less like go find the spring of life or whatever. See. Now there's one remedy in regards to uh, living forever uh, in, the, in the capacity of being a child of God. And that is through the person of Jesus Christ. And not to uh, focus too much on it, uh, he, he is the uh, prescription to a uh, physical body for all people uh, after the fact. He points to resurrection is uh, uh, true for both believers and unbelievers. I think that makes it even worse at the great white throne judgment You know, if, if, if you're following my line of theology here, uh, to uh, be the answer to uh, having a resurrection body for all eternity, and guess what? Look at the body you get because you failed to believe in Jesus Christ, and look at your destiny. Look at your destination. There is life after death. Eat, drink, and be merry. Live for the day. You don't know what tomorrow will be, bring. 
there's this life and that's it. You know, that's mentality, generally speaking. Anyway, see, moving on here, uh, the section we were in, uh, here we give uh, documentation uh, for his death, burial, and resurrection. As is, this is in the Bible, uh, this documentation would hold up in any court, uh, a just court, <laughs> uh, as proving of his resurrection. So the historical and indisputable facts surrounding Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection place this event beyond legitimate question. Uh, one, as we are dealing with his, his death, his, his death is documented by friendly and hostile witnesses both. The Apostle John was an eyewitness, John 19. Uh, B, his disciples, Luke 23 and 24. Uh, his friends and family, including his mother, Mark 15 and John 19. Uh, D had the centurion, the Roman guard, in regards to his death. That's uh, where we pick up Mark 15, 39. As we read, uh, earlier, uh, the centurion who was standing right in front of him saw the way he breathed his last. Uh, it was in such a way uh, that it came across this centurion that he just simply willingly gave up his spirit. Uh, I, I, obviously, you probably had to be there to truly appreciate what's going on here. But either way, uh, in the event and manner of how his soul and human spirit exited his body, uh, left such an indelible pressure upon this centurion, uh, he became a believer. Truly, this man was the son of God. Then you have uh, E, the, a great crowd that was part and parcel as eyewitnesses. Uh, Luke 13, 48. Luke 23, 48, excuse me. I'll get it right one day. Uh, here, following the uh, parallel of the centurion, uh, here it brings about uh, his expression of further words that came from him uh, that he was innocent of any of what uh, crime he was claimed to have committed. Certainly this man was innocent, verse 48, and all the multitudes who came together for this spectacle, when they observed what, what had happened, began to return beating their breasts. Uh, the execution of criminals uh, was generally a public affair, not unlike uh, uh, what our country has been familiar with, uh, especially in old days of hangings and things of this nature in Europe. Uh, the guillotine, uh, it would be uh, one big party. And now uh, they all get their privacy as they uh, put uh, some juice in their veins and put them to sleep and let them die that way. Uh, one of the reasons why capital punishment uh, it, it does nothing really uh, too much effect in regards to this country is because they've removed the teeth from it in, it, in its legal execution by letting people live on death row for 10, 15 years after the fact. Uh, uh, their, uh, the privacy of, of their executions, uh, you put them out there in the town square and start doing this stuff again, I guarantee you, uh, it will have impact. No, not everybody is going to uh, straighten up because of these things. Uh, but uh, uh, overall, uh, it is one of the best method methods in order to deter uh, crime in regards to a society is by making these executions public and it should be quick after the fact. If you're guilty, uh, execute them if you're found guilty. You say, well, what if they're innocent? 
Well, Jesus was innocent. What, 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 what? God has it all in control. Maybe that's the way the person's going to be martyred out. Who knows? See. Anyway. So you had the crowd that was uh, part of the spectacle, if you will. Uh, but uh, uh, what started off uh, to be some type of a party atmosphere, if you will, was go watch this guy get crucified. These Romans, they know how to kill a guy. Uh, ended up uh, that uh, uh, God completely and totally uh, turned around their whole emotional uh, being uh, to uh, being in anguish, et cetera, et cetera. Beating their breasts. That's, that, that is uh, an over way uh, to demonstrate uh, just how tore up inside you are emotionally. If you had the Jewish leadership, they were witness, obviously, to his death, Matthew 27, 62 through 62, 66. The next day, uh, which is the one after the preparation uh, in regards to Christ's crucifixion, uh, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that when he said he was still alive, that Stephen said, After three days I am to rise again. See, they understood what he was saying, even though they would flippantly uh, throw out uh, uh, these false notions on occasion. What, this temple, oh, three days this temple uh, took all these years to build, etc. cetera? Yeah. Understand people, uh, uh, sometimes religious people are, are, are just naturally argumentative. <laughs> they don't care. Therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Obviously, they know where the grave's at. They've seen him buried. Lest, he be, uh, lest the disciples come and steal him away and say to the people, he has risen from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard. Go make it as secure as you know how. They went and made the grave secure, and along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. So they were party to this whole ordeal. Obviously, they're the ones that uh, drug him to court. Uh, obviously, they uh, were given uh, certain freedoms under Roman rule uh, to judge their own people. Uh, but they had to go in and they had to convince the higher court of Rome uh, of their judgment. And the penalty for a false uh, claim of false society is death under the law. So, you know, gee, you have the, the soldiers sent to expedite death. Uh, John 19, 33 and 34. Jesus was crucified Friday before the Sabbath, which began at 6 p.m. that evening. Uh, under the law, uh, the Jews could not allow someone to be up on the cross being executed on the Sabbath. So in order to help crucifixion along, Crucifixion was not a quick manner of death by any stretch of the imagination, usually. I'm not saying that it couldn't have that effect. But usually it could be a very long and painful death. Here are people lasting on the cross, you know, depending on how they're crucified, etc., cetera, uh, for a day or so. And they commissioned 
uh, the guards uh, to hasten to death to go around and break the bones of the people on the cross if they have not already died before time to take them off the cross and have time to bury them so they're not rendered unclean and all these other things. And they go around and uh, this sets in shock uh, then whatever other physiological effect that it has and people tend to die pretty quick then after the fact. Uh, an interesting note on this one is when they came to Jesus, uh, he was already dead. Uh, they didn't have to break his bone. And there's a prophecy in regard to Christ in his manner of death that no bones would be broken. And this reflects upon the fact that when he was crucified, he wasn't crucified through his hand, he was crucified through his wrist, whereas the stake went between the cartilage and the bone on his wrist. And that's how he hung as well as on his feet. And uh, uh, then he, uh, they, he was omitted in regards to going and breaking any bones after the fact to ensure his death. So uh, that is uh, the scenario as a set here in John 19, 33 through 34. Verse 31, the Jews therefore because it was a day of preparation uh, so that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath for the Sabbath here was uh, a high holy Sabbath. Asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. 32, the soldiers therefore came and broke the legs of the first man and of the other man who was crucified with him. Christ was uh, crucified with two common thieves on the cross. Uh, uh, again, uh, these, the uh, principle of volition is brought out in their example. Uh, one thief uh, ridiculed him derided him, full of derision. Uh, if you're God, save yourself, save us along with you. You know, that type, type of deal. Uh, the other guy, uh, that's what brought out his pause volition. <laughs> Being on a cross at that point in time in history next to another criminal uh, that is as negative as, as a, a doornail next to the Messiah himself who called down the criminal who was making fun of Jesus and he became a believer right there on the cross. So again, see these very examples <laughs> shows you God's in control of volition. In other words, he's in control not that he forces volition, but he's in control in regards to uh, what it takes to, uh, for that volition to manifest itself, either negative or positive. He's in control of circumstances, situations that will bring that about. The volition operates independently in regards to uh, what God may do, do otherwise. It's neutral, if you will, to, in that respect. But he's in control. And people are not going to die and go to hell that otherwise would believe. And he'll have them in the perfect situation, perfect spot, for perfect timing as necessary for them to come to saving faith. And then if you want to expand it onto phase two faith, uh, it works just the same way. That's not the way uh, the universal church uh, operates. They don't have that kind of faith. And again, this does not diminutize our uh, responsibility of witness of the life. But this whole salesmanship technique uh, this whole uh, evangelizing circus that has been created uh, through the uh, denominational world, uh, all this stuff is, is simply just energy of the flesh. You can't pray people positive. They have to come to it on their own cognition and willpower. Verse 33, but coming to Jesus, when they saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Verse 34, but one of the soldiers pierced his side with the spear. Immediately there came out blood and water, uh, which was evidence of his physical death. For Jesus, he carries the scars of the stakes in his hand and his feet and on his side in his resurrection body, a badge of honor. 
a badge of honor. Who in the world in their right mind would ever look at that as a badge of honor? But before God, it's the highest honor that can be bestowed upon an individual because of the sacrifice and what he accomplished on that cross. And the whole world, if you will, evil world, essentially uh, was uh, uh, against him in that sense. He had no real support. Even his own beloved disciples uh, uh, fled in fear. And he truly pictures the depravity of mankind as he stands alone uniquely as a son of God in this capacity. That's what we're all about. This is why we keep our nose at dry and so in regard to the Bible doctrine. Because he truly is our number one celebrity. You cannot place enough accolades, enough glory upon what he has accomplished in this world. The rest of it is nothing but lip service. As God says, you honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. What promotes this thinking in regard to their own minds is the doctrine in our soul. So after his death, then obviously what follows his burial, point two. Uh, that is also the subject of Old Testament prophecy, point A. Isaiah 53, 9. Isaiah 53 is loaded with messianic prophecy, uh, centers on uh, his person, uh, surrounding his work on the cross, his death, etc. Who has believed our message? Verse 1. And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The power of God. The arm of the Lord is a metaphorical euphemism for the power of God is omnipotence. And truly, uh, it is uh, been uh, revealed through the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, where he grew up before him like a tender shoot for God the Father. And like a root uh, out of parched ground, his external environment was one of hostility and negative volition. John the Baptist uh, was a voice in the wilderness. That's, what, uh, that's how he's defined in his uh, evangelism of Israel to show you just how negative the, the nation had become. A spiritual uh, wilderness, a spiritual desert. And that's truly uh, what our world uh, is becoming now and has become even though there's pure gold out there for those who want to uh, uh, remove themselves and quit uh, uh, snacking on uh, the dog's vomit uh, from believers uh, in the fundy world as well as unbelievers. The false human viewpoint in regards to that there, that's out there. That'll dry up my tears, huh? Picture that in your mind. Dog's vomit. He has no stately form or majesty. All the uh, uh, great painters in the world, Michelangelo's and things, uh, they're pictures of what they think God and Jesus Christ is. But understand, these are just pictures of imaginations of men. Uh, Jesus Christ uh, was, was a Semitic Jew uh, of normal stature. Uh, he obviously uh, was a very stout, strong. He was a carpenter by trade. And uh, they're not uh, weakling, uh, weaklings in that regards. Uh, but uh, he had uh, uh, no halo or anything that was above his head, all these pictures. 
Understand, this is just religious people with imaginations. If you saw him on the street today uh, in our own modern society, you could not identify him based on his physical appearance from anybody else. You see him in glorified state, you could. <laughs> But, you know, that's religiosity. That's the religious world uh, trying to manufacture <coughs> the movie of all times, the religion uh, that uh, uh, they uh, want to create, put all the Hollywood spin on it. Uh, you did a, a real movie in regards to Jesus Christ, uh, people would probably get bored with it about a quarter of the way through that we should look upon him, nor appearance that he, uh, we should be attracted to him. He had no uh, phenomenal physique apart from what one might be wiry or whatever in regards to being in construction. He was despised and forsaken of men. This was his ministry. This was his test set before him. The perfect representative of, of God the Father and God's plan and Bible doctrine uh, culminating in his person. And this is how the world looked at him. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The lupe uh, sorrow that uh, he experienced uh, to the, uh, in, in view of the depravity, spiritual depravity of people around him. Like Martha and Mary, Mary uh, carrying on uh, emotionally over Lazarus' death and all that uh, great scene, and others around him, uh, even his own family, see. And like one from whom uh, men hid their face. You don't want to be associated with this guy. Uh, practice social distancing with this guy. He was despised. We did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, verse 4, and our sorrows he carried. Jesus Christ, throughout this all, all this, uh, remained sinless. Uh, he had no sin nature, but he had all the external, external temptations and pressures of being a, a human being living in Satan's world. Smitten of God and afflicted as he took on the punishment and wrath of God uh, for our sins and substitute, but he was pierced through for our transgressions Verse 5, he was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening of our well-being being, uh, fell upon him. And by his scourging, we are healed. Uh, the Holy Rollers like to use that verse uh, the, uh, to know physical healing, not spiritual healing. We're spiritual, spiritually healed uh, through the suffering that he endured and put up with and willingly uh, submitted himself to on our behalf. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Sheep are generally dull, stupid animals. <laughs> See? And that's why mankind is pictured before God in this regard. Uh, all uh, wandering around uh, with no sense, uh, like no sense. And I don't care that there's a wolf out there prowling around or a lion or some other predator. Somebody else might try to steal them uh, and fleece them for their wool, you know, whatever. That's why they need a shepherd. See, that's the idea there. Each of us turn to his own way. We think our, our way is best. We know more than God. See, uh, well, uh, we can do it better than the, uh, the avenues of the spiritual gifts that God provided for the church uh, to operate and function under. See, that type of mentality. We'll create our own ministries. Uh, that's a popular one among uh, uh, believers who uh, want to not have to confine themselves to the rigors of MBR and being in Bible class all the time. I have my own ministry, the cowboy ministry, being out there in, in the, uh, on their horses, you know, out in the wild. And, uh, we're so close to God. You know, that type of mentality. I, I was used to hearing that a lot growing up. As, uh, uh, as preachers would rationalize that. <laughs> Each of us turned to, to his own way, 
but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. The principle of unlimited atonement, he died for all sins of all men of human history, from Adam and Eve to the last man that will be born on this planet. At the end of uh, human history, the battle of Gog and Magog, finalizing Terminus Aquim, or quo, whichever one it is, the end. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not uh, open his mouth, moan and groan and complain, uh, didn't uh, try to uh, defend himself apart from when he was asked point blank in regards to something that expressed the truth. Uh, when uh, part of the legal arguments that the religious leaders were using to the leaders of Rome is that uh, Jesus was claiming to be a king. And hence, uh, uh, he is one to uh, try to usurp uh, Roman rule, the Caesar of the time. Uh, he's an insurrectionist. And obviously, uh, they were taking uh, his doctrine and wrenching it out of context for their own uh, devious means. And when Pilate asked him uh, if that was true, that he was a king, he said, yeah, you've spoken right, I'm a king. Kill me. <laughs> One of these days, I'll show you. Of course, uh, that's my added words. But that was his good confession. He didn't deny it. It, it, it would have saved his life. All he would have said, well, not in this life. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, we're talking here uh, a couple millennia away from here, a couple thousand years. Now he didn't do it. See, you don't cater to negative volition. You don't have to. You're not obligated to. There's, there's that whole mentality you know, that's out there. By oppression and judgment, verse 8, uh, he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered, uh, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due, that he died on behalf uh, of all mankind who deserved the wrath of God of themselves. He was completely innocent. He didn't deserve any of that. His grave was assigned with wicked men. Yet he is with a rich man in his, and that should be, if you don't have a marking Bible, uh, deaths in the plural. It's a nominee, uh, noun, plural, masculine, with the third masculine singer suffix, muth, in the Hebrew. The plural. It's in the plural, in his deaths, because he had done no violence. nor was there any deceit in his mouth. He only spoke the truth. The uh, rich man in his death was none other than the Joseph of Arimathea, uh, the one who provided the tomb. Whatever the Pharisees might have had in mind to put him in a criminal's grave or whatever after the fact. Uh, God overruled all that. A uh, prophecy is to be fulfilled. Uh, that was Matthew uh, 27, 57 through 60. So he obviously uh, was an eyewitness to the burial. And it was in the evening there came a rich man from Marimathea named Joseph who himself had also become a disciple of Jesus, who was a believer. This is Passover on Friday, April the 3rd, 33 AD. That's after death. I don't care what they want to change him to. Uh, this man went to, man went to Pilate. Now this took guts. It's like going to the governor of the state. And asked for the body of Jesus, and Pilate ordered it to be given over to him. Verse 59, and Jesus, Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, proper burial garment, and laid it in his own new tomb, 
which he had hewn out, hewn out in the rock, perfect burial spot. You can find any uh, odors of decay and things of this nature and keeping predators out, carve it out of a rock. So uh, this was uh, an expensive burial plot to ha hand chisel <laughs> out of rock. You know, we look at tunnels and stuff that are uh, built through uh, mountains and hills and stuff for trains and things of the day, but look at the machines they got. And you think even a century ago, a century and a half, they were doing that. And they didn't have the machines they did today. But still, they had dynamite. They didn't have dynamite back in these days. So uh, that's something, that's one you don't want to be paying them by the hour. <laughs> We'll, we'll sign a contract here for you. And he rolled a large stone against the entrance of the tomb and went away. So uh, he was personally involved in uh, setting Jesus' corpse, human corpse, uh, in the tomb. Obviously, the soul and human spirit's gone. It's just an empty shell at this point in time. greatly disfigured from the event of the cross. See, then you had the actual burial. That was 59 and 60 there, as we read it. Uh, D, Joseph and others knew the place. Uh, along with Joseph, verse 61, and Mary Magdalene was there, and the other Mary sitting opposite the grave. So they uh, were watching the burial process. He, Joseph himself, sealed the tomb with a large stone. That was verse 60, Matthew 27. After the Jews posted a Roman detail at the entrance of the tomb to prevent the disciples stealing the body. And when we read that, referred to it, Chapter 26, 65, and 66. Uh, that's the wrong chapter. Hang on. Oh, we just read it somewhere. I'll let you figure that one back out. I'll check it for myself. Book, Matthew 27, 55, and 56. 65. Oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. brain's too cluttered up, up up here. It's hard for me to see past, to see the most simple things. Anyway, I knew we'd read it. Old age, man. Uh, three, then we go to his resurrection. Not really old, but he's living in the 70s. That's my excuse, that's my story, and I'm sticking with it. <laughs> Uh, first of all, in regards to his resurrection, uh, none of the disciples or the women who followed Jesus believed in his bodily resurrection. They believed the doctrine, but they could not take it and step over the line with it and apply it in his case. It's just, it's just one of those weird phenomenons. Uh, when you're not gapping the truth of doctrine, that it hamstrings you in putting two and two together 
and figuring out certain things sometimes. So along those lines, uh, one, uh, you had the disciples were hiding in fear. You think if there's going to be uh, a crowd uh, gathered, uh, it would be around uh, the tomb of Jesus, waiting for the day he's going to walk out of there. <laughs> but what people were doing is they were running away. Matthew 26, 56. And again, uh, not to diminutize uh, the pressure that they were under. I mean, they're associated with a man that's being executed as a criminal, as an insurrectionist, a traitor, if you will, to Rome. Uh, to be party to that could mean their own lives. We understand that. But with doctrine, uh, they could have uh, at least uh, uh, arose over that in terms of their uh, ability to faith rest rather than running off uh, berserk over it. And uh, they, they split immediately upon his arrest, basically, in that regards. To not be associated with him is their idea. Uh, we're next. But all, uh, verse 6, but all this has taken place in terms of, uh, of uh, his betrayal by Judas Iscariot, uh, that the scriptures of the prophets may be fulfilled. And then uh, Matthew records for us, then all the disciples left him and fled. Peter, with all his braggadocious, uh, I'll be with you. Uh, just let him uh, try to do anything to you over my dead body, uh, that lip service. And now he's one of the ones that fled. A true fear hits you. Uh, something happens to your emotional core. Uh, adrenaline kicks in, and it's like your body has a mind of its own, and it does. And you're out of there. Yeah, you don't think clear. Uh, all, you want, all you can see is, is I don't want to be in this spot, in this place at this time. See. To overrun that, overrule that fear uh, takes a lot of grit and determination sometimes. So, but they succumbed. And so uh, they did not truly hold to the doctrine. A resurrection. This is just simply all part of the process. Even though over and over, Bible class after Bible class, he hammered on this uh, with his disciples. I'm going to be turned over to the religious leaders, to the Jews. I'm going to be killed, and then I'm going to be raised up. And they still would not gap it. And that's a uh, that is the defense mechanism of, of the SCA uh, not willing to simply embrace the truth across the board. They, uh, the SCA uh, wants to uh, govern it and rule it with its own uh, mind, its own thinking, its own creative juices of what these things really mean. I don't know how else to explain this to you. When you gap the truth of Bible doctrine, it's like the proverbial bullet that's shot between your eyes. You see it. It's clear. But if you've got an SCA issue, uh, uh, some aspect of your volition uh, that is not truly uh, driving the uh, driving force of wanting to know the truth, etc., it will bite you in the ass every time in regards to truly how you gap these things. This is what the funny world, the Christian world, fails to understand. Why, uh, before every Bible class, we rebound. And I encourage you to continue to do so, even if I get you out of fellowship because of, of uh, my mistakes you know, in numbering or verses, generally speaking. That was quite an eye-opener. All the years, I mean, I, I'll never forget that first time I ever sat in Bible class and I actually practiced rebound. Uh-huh. And God judged my sins. And I was cleansed from all unrighteousness. Experientially, the first time I ever heard that Bible taught, that I just sit there, I was in awe. I was totally and completely in awe. Thirty-some years I've been in the funny church. 
And the Bible has always seemed to be a mixed up, uh, whatever uh, people want to make it uh, uh, mean uh, type of book. And how many times I've tried to read it on your own, see? And you don't get anywhere. You don't have all the pieces in part. You don't have the pastor teacher. You don't have God, the Holy Spirit. All these things working on your behalf as God's lined, lined it out in these conditions, see? So, two, the women went to the tomb expecting to find a dead body. Uh, that was Mark 16, 1 through 8. When the Sabbath is over, Mary Magdalene, the, Mary, uh, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices that they might come and anoint him uh, to... Uh, get the tomb opened up after the weekend is over. Obviously, uh, some 72 hours has passed now. Jesus has been resurrected. And uh, they're expecting him to find him in the tomb, his body. And very early on the first day of the week, they went, uh, came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking out, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. And in the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, Do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazarene, who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter, He is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he said to you. And they went out and fled for the tomb for trembling and astonishment had gripped them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. So uh, still, even with the evidence right in front of them, <laughs> uh, how shook up they are. And that's the way truth can hit people sometimes uh, whenever uh, they are uh, misled and misguided in their own thinking in regards to it when it does hit them straight in the face in a circumstance or situation. And you go, good God, the Bible is right. He was right. What does all this mean now? And uh, uh, to finish this off, Peter was alone with his shame. Uh, that was Mark 14, 72. And maybe a cock crowed a second time. It had already been prophesied that Peter would do this by Jesus uh, as he... Uh, was bragging that uh, he would never leave Jesus' side, would defend him with his life and all these other things. And Jesus said, uh, you're, you're going to run like a, a chick with his head cut off. You don't know which direction to go. And Peter remembered how Jesus had made a remark to him before a cock crows twice, you will deny me three times. And he began to weep. He began, he began to cry for his lack of spiritual courage. And then 16.7, Uh, Christ says, uh, go tell his disciples and Peter. <laughs> Rouse up Peter. Let him know about this. He is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he said to you. Father, again, thank you for the truth of your word. We ask God, the Holy Spirit, to continue to lighten us these things. In Jesus' name, amen.